Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. All right. Welcome back again. Um, March is proving to be as interesting and weather-wise as February, which I guess isn't too much of a surprise, but. Well, and March always has like that warm tendency where people want to get out there and start doing stuff. Usually we have to tell people to stop, but today we're going to talk about a topic that maybe you should start thinking about it and it gets overlooked. That's right. We have a special guest today, Mariana Vlotovich Denlovich. She has a lot of background with orchards in Michigan, a lot of commercial orchard experience, and she is our extension specialist for fruits and also works with the Master Gardener program. Thank you for joining us, Mira. Thank you for having me. All right. So one of the things that we got some calls for at the end of the summer last year were that a lot of the apple trees were defoliating earlier in the summer than normal. And so what are some potential causes for that? Uh, Potentially problem with some drought. I would say that at least where I'm at around Morgantown and, and in the areas where I visited all the summer, The main cause for early defoliation was actually the um, apple scab, pear scab. We're talking about the pears. Some other uh, fruit species had also issues with uh, some fungal diseases that would cause deletions on the leaves and consequently leaf fall early defoliation. So now apple scab will affect apples and crab apples and like you said, pears. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay, so if someone saw this, and and what are some other symptoms of apple scab? Well, the major symptom is uh, when you're looking at the leaf, uh, you will see those black spots, the lesions. And this is definitely, you know, it could be just individual lesions, or you can have so many lesions that basically they uh, merge together and create so-called sheet scab symptom. And that definitely leads to a leaf drop. Well, Mira, let me just kind of give you a little glimpse and we'll get a call like in August, you know, you kind of start off talking about like apple scab, but we'll uh-huh. get a call in July, August, and somebody will say, hey, um, you know, my grapes look like raisins or my my uh, my peaches getting all pruney and they and they, they're just drying. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and and then you have to explain to them that a lot of these diseases and things that you're talking about, like you had to start managing back in March and April. Right. Do you want to give us just kind of some some sprays that are really critical that will save people headaches four months from now? Yes. Actually, let me back up before I start talking about the spraying program, but everything starts with sanitation and good pruning. If uh, you prune your uh, apples and crab apples regularly and keep that canopy or that crown open so that wind can uh, go through and you cut down on a drying period, you know, after the rain, you actually want those leaves to dry as soon as possible. So you're trying to reduce the potential for environment to develop that will facilitate the fungal disease development, in this particular case, the uh, apple scab. So if you haven't done any pruning yet, that's the number one thing to do. Secondly, while it's still sort of a delayed dormant period before you have any green tissue showing up, or you should be applying some preventive spray, which uh, would require you applying some uh, copper. And uh, you can buy the copper, you know, even at Lowe's and and, uh, Walmart, you know. So just ask for the copper spray, liquid copper spray. It is good. And in commercial settings, what we are normally doing, we combine the copper with our horticultural oil. And if the temperatures are kind of on the cool side, you you go with 1.5% to 2% of oil in combination with your copper. 
So this um, combination of these two materials is going to provide you some insect control. Anything that all winters on the surface of the tree, once gets smothered with that oil is going to suffocate and so you're kind of eliminating that eliminating all of this so you're talking about scale insects you're talking about potentially some uh, spider mite tags and stuff so all of this is going to be taken care of by the oil on the other hand the oil is going to facilitate absorption of copper and the copper is both uh, bactericide and fungicide, meaning that it's going to control some of the bacterial diseases as well as some of the fungal diseases. And in this particular case, we're talking about the uh, apple scab. So this is going to be your first application for the apple scab. I got to tell you, the apple scab starts with some spore discharge, and those spores are within the fruiting bodies in those lesions that we mentioned before on the leaves that are down in the litter under the tree. So once we have those spore mature and they're driven by uh, the temperatures, they're uh, about 32. So this is the threshold. It's still low temperature, but it's enough for those spores to mature. So in my experience, let's say 20 years that I've been up in uh, West Central Michigan, in my 20 years uh, there and monitoring the spores, actually co uh, collecting them and checking them under the microscope, I had four years when I had the spore discharge before I had any green tissue showings, meaning that with the spores present, the minute you get those uh, green tips, green leaves unfolding, and it starts raining, you have all the... Um, ingredients for infection to start. So by spraying this early, you're sort of eliminating some of this uh, inoculum that is potentially present there. You want to protect that. So even if they, the spores do land on that tissue, and they're not going to be able to uh, pass the germination phase. So this is something, you know, to, to definitely take in consideration. Mira, um, can I ask you a question? Sure. So for the horticultural oils, Karen and I always tell listeners that if you, if you read the label, it says be careful when temperatures drop below 40 degrees oh, yes. in a 24-hour period. <laughs> um, so, so I understand how critical it is to put it on early. But you do have to watch that 24-hour period, correct? Exactly. Actually, I would go a little bit further, in not necessarily 24, but uh, preferably 48. Because oil is going to soften up that tissue. And it's going to make it more prone to uh, frost freeze injury. So you definitely need to monitor the forecast. And you have to have that window minimum 24 up to 48 hours where you're not going to have the temperatures that are going to drop around freezing point. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And I know how it can be very tricky, but it's also very critical to get a good start on those fruit diseases. Exactly. And then another thing is also, if I may add here, you know, the most critical period is actually once you start having those green tips, that green tissue showing, and it's evolving, you know, in developing. And that green tissue is the most vulnerable. So from that point on, you know, once you have the green tissue and you know that you have the spore presence in your orchard, you have to be on the alert and watch the weather. So before, I'm more for that uh, prevention program uh, rather than go and try to cure something. It is not going to be as effective. So the most effective way to control this or manage this disease is by putting some applications that will create sort of a, a film on the uh, leaves, on that green tissue. And so when the spores hit, they will not going to be able to penetrate that 
layer, so they're going to be basically, they're going to die off, and so you prevent the uh, infection. Another thing to worry about is uh, this particular disease is the function of temperature and the duration of exposure to the rain. So you need the rain and you need the uh, adequate temperature for that. So if the temperatures are a little bit lower, it takes longer period of time for infection to start. But the optimum temperature for the scab is in the 60s, basically. So you're talking some 60-some degrees, and it takes only several hours for that infection to start. In my experience up in Michigan, again, you know, we had one year when we had 72 hours of wetting and the temperatures were in the 30s and we still ended up with heavy infection period. We had the spores. We had very long wetting event. Even though the temperatures were on the low end, we ended up having the infection. So, um, you know, one of the things that we have at our disposal, Karen and me, we have spray schedules for certain things. And I know at that half inch green that, that you're mm-hmm. talking about, very early on in uh, tree fruit development, one of the sprays that people always talk about is that lime sulfur. Is there, it, could, you, could you tell us a little bit more about the lime sulfur sprays? Well, I'm not the fan. <laughs> uh, anything that has to deal with the sulfur, it has to be applied a little bit more frequently. And you have to have, regardless of what you're spraying on, you have to have a good coverage. I would prefer to go with something, and it's also easily and readily available, something like Captan. Captan is a good fungicide that uh, will stay there, you know, in between the two sprays. It's going to last you uh, at least for about 10 to 14 days. And in case of re-wetting, it will redistribute itself on the leaf. Now, the other issue here is not necessarily just uh, the material you're spraying. I already mentioned the coverage. The other thing is also to keep in mind the um, period in between the two sprays. Let's say we spray every seven days. And within these seven days, you have those leaves that you have sprayed already, but you have a few, quite a few early in the season that unrolled and they haven't had any spray. So these are the ones they're going to to be where the infection is going to occur. So for that reason, when I'm talking to either commercial growers or, or the homeowners, I says, you have to tighten up your spray schedule early in a season till you have the leaves fully un- unfolded. Then you can stretch your sprays a little bit longer periods. Instead of seven days, you can put them on every 10 days. And if you have done a really good spraying program and you prevented those lesions from appearing on the leaves, because uh, you have two major cycles. You have so-called primary infection period, which starts with the emergence of the green tissue till about mid-June. It could be anywhere from about a week to, to two weeks after the petal fall. So till mid-June. So this is when you have the end of primary, meaning that most of the roll spores have been discharged. So if you don't have any lesions on the leaves, you're fine. And for all practical purposes, you can stop spraying the fungicides for that particular disease. If you have the lesions on the leaves, then you're opening yourself for a battle throughout for the, uh, for the rest of the season. Now you have the inoculum that is present within the lesions right on the leaves, and you have a different type of a spore. It's a conidia spore. So those have much easier way to attack leaves or the young developing fruit and create the secondary infection period. 
and Captan, I think, is such a nice spray. I have recommended Captan quite a bit. It's easy to get, um, mm -hmm. and it's also so universal. Yes. And it's recommended in things like apple and pears and stone fruits and grapes, uh, strawberries and blueberries. So it is a very nice spray to have for the backyard grower. Yes, and it's quite economical. I mean, if you buy targeted material, you know, for each of the diseases, you're going to end up with a tremendous spray bill. So use something that is going to have a broad spectrum. And Captain has been in use for decades. And we still do not have any issues developing the resistance to it. Some of these new materials, you know, like um, your rally, for example, or, or Sovereign or anything like that, they have a tendency, they're really good materials and very effective, but have a tendency that the fungi, the disease-causing organisms that cause certain diseases that we want to fight, have a relatively rapid development of resistance to those materials. So when we are spraying, and particularly working with those materials, we have to look and try to manage the resistance to fungicides. So let's say, for example, if you haven't had a spray and the rain caught you with your hands down, you know, so uh, you have to go back. And if you're using that rally or microbutanil, whatever, the, under which name it comes, you know, as a trade name, but this is, you know, the main ingredient, microbutanil. So you would put that at full strength, plus 50% strength of your captan or any other fungicide that is used to prevent the infection or before spraying. So that will sort of, you know, improve the life length <laughs> or avoid that uh, resistance development so we can have that material a little bit longer. Combination is pretty good to control other diseases as well, you know. But And we, we use it sometimes as a kickback action because the microbutanol can, from the beginning of the infection till about uh, 72 to 90 plus hours, has a kickback action, meaning that it's going to suppress the development of the lesions and the infection already in progress. But that's the key word, suppress. It's not going to eliminate it. So it's not as effective as if you're applying the spray before that infection actually starts, so preventing the infection. And that's, and that's exactly why I wanted to kind of discuss we're going to get them. Karen and I are going to get those calls in July and August. You know, why mm -hmm. does my fruit look so bad? Yes. And it's only things that are going to have to be done now, you know, in March, April, May, those critical early months. And in fact, um, you know, a couple of those sprays that you were saying, Captan, I have rated for good control. If we're talking about apples and pears of scab right. and fruit rots and blotches that you mentioned, um, the mycobutanil does give you powdery mildew and rust protection. Mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to be rated in the captan according to my guide you mm -hmm. know but but you'll notice that we haven't talked about a single insect yeah you know at this point we're just preventative spray for fungal diseases and i really think i mean other than the, the stink bugs i know stink bugs have given orchards headaches in more recent years and coddling moth too is becoming more common well, there is another one. Actually, my little orchard here in Morgantown that I started planting back in 2018, we're trying to establish cider apple orchard and also have some of these vintage cultivars that were once common all throughout the Appalachian region. So I would like to have sort of like a collection of these old apples as well. Well, my problem last year when it comes to insects was with uh, plum curculio. Oh, man, I had plum curculio just about on every single apple that you can possibly find in that early season before I, 
I started, you know, removing them. But this is one to to pay attention to. And that particular one is going to uh, become active fairly soon. I've seen damage to the buds when they were not supposed to be active yet. But they would chew up the buds, not just on apples, but also on uh, on peaches, some of the stone fruit as well. And now with this confusion with the climate and the warm up, you know, once the ground warms up a little bit, they will start moving from the adjacent wooded lots or uh, uh, any place where you have sort of a like... Um, a burn pile or you have some boxes and stuff, any place that is going to protect them and allow them to uh, overwinter. Once it starts warming up, they're going to start moving from those spots into the orchard and they're going to start climbing up the trunks and spread around on the scaffolds and start munching first on the but even though all our models, and when you're looking into biology of that particular insect, it says, you know, it has to be warm about 75 degrees plus at least for a couple, three days before they start moving, or the average daily temperature should be like around uh, 55, 65 degrees for about a week. Well, as we were talking before this uh, recording right now, Last Saturday was 80 degrees. Today, there is snow on the ground. So it's just up and down, and so it's very unpredictable. So all these rules or or observations that were solid and very valid 30 years ago, when the climate was a little bit more normal, need to be readjusted to the climate we're facing today. So um, I would expect a relatively early activity of these PCs. Uh, there are some traps that you can actually make yourself. So you would construct um, sort of like a fake trunk, uh, just kind of cross the cardboard, and they need to be next door to the apple and make them about three, four feet tall and paint them dark gray. On the top of the trap, you have a container with some screen on it, so it will allow them to get in, but it's not going to allow them to come out. You don't need any pheromones or anything like that, so this is easy. So just like regular window screen? Yeah, the window screen. And you have that, you know that they're active, and then you can start spraying for them. And they're basically starting immediately, you know, uh, with the damage. So they start showing up once we already have the fruit set, you know, the, the little fruitlets are already there. And uh, the females are already mated. So as soon as they start moving around, they're looking for the, that little fruitlet to deposit the egg. Egg laying under the skin in the fruit can extend through June. So it does start relatively early. And what would someone use to control plum curculio? Well, there's several different materials. You know, again, something that you can easily find would be uh, probably any of the pyrethroids, like pyrethroid and stuff, but there is Altacor, uh, Delegate, Imidan, that's one of the organophosphates. When you're spraying Imidan, you know, just make sure that or any for that matter, make sure that you're following the label recommendations when it comes to uh, clothing, masks, and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And definitely don't spray anything in your sneakers. You have to have the rubber boots. You have to have the neutral gloves or any gloves that will give you uh, their rated for chemical applications. Right. Always good to read the label and follow the instructions for personal protective equipment. And before we run out of time and we are really close to it, I just want to let you all know that there is a, a program out there online that can help you to monitor those temperatures that Mira kept bringing up. How many growing degree days, how much water, how much rain and moisture. Mira, can you tell us real quick a little bit about those predictor maps 
Uh, the weather is the crucial here. If you have the good weather information, you can actually predict the um, um, uh, infection periods or emergence and sprays and, uh, you know, for different pests. So we are talking about uh, uh, the degree days. What are the degree days? These are, this is the uh, heat accumulation, actually. And for you to calculate them, you need the minimum temperature and the maximum daily temperature. Then you find the average. For uh, scab, for example, it's base 50. So that means off of that average daily temperature, you subtract 50 and you get how many degree days you have for that particular day. So that is going to give you accumulation and it's going to tell you, you know, what needs to be done. For spore germination, that uh, base is 32. So I can calculate starting January 1st, when you're talking about, um, let's say, another one, oriental fruit moth or codling moth, that's another uh, very significant insect that we have. Degree day accumulation base 50 is for the codling moth. Once we have about 200 degree days post biofix, then we can apply some organophosphates. Or if I have, let's say, between 100, 150, then I'm targeting either the eggs or the larvae that are just hatching from the eggs. Again, depending on the temperature, it might happen within three, four days. It might happen over 10 days. If it's cooler, it's going to take longer. If it is warm, it's going to take much shorter. So these uh, various models are really good tools for us to uh, make those management decisions. Right. And the online system is nice because it allows you to just go to the disease you're interested in. You put in your location to select the weather station that's closest to you because some of them have already been loaded in. It will tell you what the danger level is. So if you're looking at fire blight, if you're looking at apple scab, if you're looking at uh, plum curculio, or uh, I believe coddling moth is on there as yes. well. Um, and oriental fruit moth too. Yeah. And so those are all things that you should be looking for. But the tool that's online is really handy in that it allows you to just see if the weather that you have had will be indicative of or, or will be enough for those problems to start happening. So you know when to start spraying. You can put your first bloom date in there. You can like, you could add your first catch. So those are all things you can watch through these forecasting models. And you don't have to do all of these calculations yourself. The research has been done and you can get this information and apply it to your orchard. Once again, thank you, Mira, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.